Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 11th episode of the Farfetch Podcast. My name is Ryan Hawk. I'm a screenwriter, prose writer, comic book writer, and a writer of many kinds. And today I'm coming with to you with a really cool story I'm super excited about called The Babel Equation. Kind of took me a while to come up with the name of this story, but I kind of figured it was very much inspired by the story of the Tower of Babel in the Bible. And when you um, hear the story, you'll kind of understand why. It's not necessarily about the changing of language like the Tower of Babel story is in the Bible, but instead it is the taking away of literacy, of reading comprehension. So the story is about basically this group of basically domestic terrorists in the United States, and they decide to basically create, with the help of an outside source called Fade, a beacon beacons that basically make it impossible for people to be able to read. It, it totally depletes reading comprehension, and it sends out this small little sound signal throughout um, a three-mile radius each beacon and basically makes it impossible for people to read. And they've hidden these things in very strange places, very difficult to find places all over the United States. And so obviously this has created a crisis, a literacy crisis, and no one can read anymore. And so that is basically the main concept of the story. And it's basically just in the United States where people can't read. And so it becomes very, very difficult. And once you get attached to the beacon, once the beacon, you hear the beacon and the sound from the beacon, you can't get rid of it. And it, and it takes a long, long time to be able to relinquish yourself from that uh, signal. So it's a very interesting story to me. I hope I executed it well. Um, obviously, I could write forever about it because I think it's so interesting. But the podcast must go on. The show must go on. And so I created something for you guys to enjoy. And I hope you do enjoy it. With that being said, my name is Ryan Hawk. I'm going to be reading you the story Babel Equation written by Ryan Hawk. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope you enjoy it. You know where I was when it started? The other soldiers in the Humvee nodded at Brussels. A red light blinked on and off inside the large vehicle, so hardly any of them could see his face when he was telling his story. Ironically enough, I was reading a book, he told them, chuckling while he did. I'm not one to read too many books, but since it was a day off at boot camp, I figured I would try to start. I'd been trying to get myself to do it, and I found the perfect excuse. He looked around as the vehicle started to rattle over what was presumably trash that had been thrown all over the streets in the West Village. If any of you have read About Face by Colonel David Hackworth, you'd understand why I was excited to get the price of honor by him, too. My buddy at the camp gave it to me. He's in Los Angeles now, so I was reading that book when it all happened. Okay, so Brussels was reading a book when it happened. That's great. Anybody else want to share before we get out of here, Vanello asked the rest of the soldiers in the Humvee. Russell made it clear he wasn't done, though. I passed page 50, so I knew I had to commit. I mean, it's a long book, but that's usually the point of no return with me in books. So I flipped this one page, I think it was 52 or something, and all the words were scattered. It's like those images you see of what it looks like when people have dyslexia, like with all the letters looking weird and flipped and thrown all around the page. That's exactly what it looked like to me. And then I kept flipping the pages and freaked out. I handed it to one of my other buddies in the tent, and he told me he couldn't read any of the words either. Then the news came on. Everyone in America had now been unable to read. No explanation. There was no science guy that they threw on the screen until several days later when they could make time to research what was going on. But by then it was too late, you know? The military soldiers were on a reconnaissance mission through the streets of New York in an attempt to find yet another scrambler beacon. Since the literary crisis began nearly eight months before, it became clear that a domestic terrorist organization was responsible. And who created this Babel equation? Who hid these beacons? An organization known only as Brainstorm. Even before the crisis, they were an anti-internet group that had attempted to dismantle countless internet systems all across the globe. At first, Brainstorm's message was focused on taking out the media, Wikipedia, and internet porn. When that didn't work, they found a way to attack America's illiteracy instead. Using technology given to them by an international organization referred to by the government as FADE, they began to plant beacons all around the country. They believed, as clearly indicated by their speeches in every major American city, that learning was one of the biggest plights of a society and it had to be destroyed. They got what they wanted. The internet was just one of the many things that ceased to exist in the literacy crisis, 
When they activated the beacons, millions were suddenly unable to read in a matter of seconds. Their brains were scrambled and unable to think clearly. Not only was there no internet, but there was also no traveling. There was no going to work and most certainly no way to keep checks and balances. Many Americans would have rather had Brainstorm take away their internet or their free will than the literacy and reading comprehension. The beacons used a scientific anomaly known as the Babel Equation to disrupt the brain's reading comprehension muscles. Each time they were activated, this small, almost inaudible sound made it impossible for any human in a three-mile radius to read. The beacons were buried underground, attached above ground or to some hiding place. The more this literacy crisis went up, it got harder to find the beacons themselves. The members of Brainstorm wore Halloween masks when they went out to plant and hide beacons. Over the eight months of the crisis, there are about a dozen of them caught in the act. Even then, little information was known about them because the members were sworn to secrecy. But the information the government did find all pointed towards the same thing. These kids were just normal kids, in their late teens and early 20s mostly. There was the occasional middle-aged man or woman, but for the most part, they were all Generation Z. Damn incels, Brussels said as he got out of the Humvee at 14th Street Union Square. The small squadron of soldiers had to be led by a native New Yorker who knew the city back and forth. None of the other soldiers could read the street signs, and hardly any of them could even tell whether they were going north or south. Briggs could drive the Humvee without being able to read any numbers or letters because he knew the streets just like Brussels did. Vanella rested his assault rifle on his left arm as he caught up to Brussel. I thought the Sarge said there was some kind of altercation here. Apparently they left, Brussel said as he walked around the square. The streets were relatively full of people walking to communes and bread lines where they would get free food or drink. Millions upon millions of Americans lost their jobs the day the literary crisis began, for obvious reasons. But the soldiers were often inspired by how united some of these people were when they couldn't see money. Of course, crime had rose because of the closing of stores and warehouses and the opportunity it gave the people, but that was over within the first month. Eight months into this thing, and you could see people providing for each other all over the country. Many people had to change their jobs entirely. Stock market traders became farmers in small towns. Editors, journalists, and novelists became chefs and burger flippers in restaurants. Without the ability to read, coders and programmers from Silicon Valley were forced to guide traffic in large highways. Millions of jobs were affected by the Babel equation, but there were also some that weren't affected at all. There were movie stars who were able to keep their jobs simply because their medium was a visual one, and artists too. Knowing how to draw became one of the most important skills in this world, because these people could convey a message to a large group of people with no words at all. Many visual artists were commissioned by the United States government to create thousands of signs to guide people through daily life. Everything had changed. The tables had turned. The artists were somehow more successful than the people who made millions. Thompson came from the back of the Humvee with his advanced metal detector and set it on the ground. He walked towards both Brussels and Vanello. The beeping from the machine got louder and louder as he moved around the brick of Union Square. The detector was made in Denmark, a country that was greatly unaffected by the American literary crisis. The Babel equation had given many countries that had been under the United States financially to get the upper hand, and quickly. The device was built to seek Fade's technology. I think it's safe to say it's right below my feet, he said, pressing some of the buttons in effort to isolate the beacon signal and figure out its exact location. Russell rubbed his chin. They had to use the sewer system to get out of there. It's the only way. The four soldiers, Russell, Vanello, Thompson, and Liquidor, made their way to the 13th Street as Briggs drove the Humvee back to the headquarters in Central Park West. When they located the sewer covering to where they believed the beacon could be hiding in, they used a crowbar to open it. Russell had to smack his foot down on the crowbar just so they could loosen the covering enough to lift it off the nearby pavement. Russell was visually repulsed by the smell. Man, people might not know how to read but anymore, but their shit still stinks. That's a damn fact. Vanello looked at Brussel with a smirk and started working his way down the open manhole. Liquidor did the same thing and then Thompson. Brussel acknowledged the fact that there were several citizens gawking at them while they were going inside the sewer system, so he made sure to close the lid as tight as he could when they entered. They dropped down into a shallow stream of dirty water. Liquidor activated his flashlight. Man, it smells like piss and vinegar down here. Thompson, the quiet one of the group, finally made himself known once he turned on his flashlight. 
Is there some kind of generator? I see lights along the brick ceiling. He couldn't. He could have answered his own question. The truth was, electricians had to be able to read to effectively do their job, and since the crisis, there were no electricians in existence. The large electric machines and fields could work on their own for a few weeks, sure, and they did in those early weeks, but after a time, they required electricians to keep with maintenance and repair. To put it bluntly, electricity wasn't possible in this new world. The four soldiers continued trudging through the water until they found a platform they could walk on. Vanello brought out his metal detector again and started waving it in the air. The loud water made it slightly difficult to hear the detector, but its sounds were obnoxious enough to stand out. The beeper got louder and louder while Vanello and the group reached this older sewer area, probably under Chinatown or Little Italy or further down Manhattan, maybe even to Washington Square. Vanello himself was the only person who ducked down far enough to crawl through a brick sewer and continued monitoring. I think I found it, he said, as he pointed towards this blinking green beacon that was attached to the side of the brick with some kind of putty. He grabbed for it with his hand, but found that the putty substance had already stuck the beacon in place. Vanello grabbed a knife from his belt and started using the blade to shave off the hardened putty to the best of his ability. After a while, he was just barely able to put the thing off, but he did manage to do it, although the beacon did fall into the water just as soon as he tugged it. Liquidor looked at Vanello. Are you serious, man? Vanello dug his hands into the dirty sewer water to find the beacon. He closed his eyes and held his tongue so if his hand touched something repulsive, he would be able to at least be prepared for it. But thankfully, with the small amount of browsing, he was able to recover the beacon and bring it up to the surface. Well, I think it's off. Bustle pointed towards the blinking green light on the top of the thing. I don't think so. It's one of the reasons why so many people are still illiterate. Russell grabbed onto the beacon and began to chuck it to a nearby wall. It's because they think that things are broke when they really aren't. The moment the beacon hit the brick wall, it broke into about seven different pieces. There was the light that still flashed back and forth into water, making the murky water green every couple of seconds. Then there was what Vanello knew as the signal amplifier, rushing along the water with a small speaker that voiced the mind-numbing sound that took away reading comprehension skills. After the four destroyed the beacon, Thompson made sure to document where it was. He used a camera to take several images of the environment so the other squadrons could figure out where Brainstorm might be planting another one of the beacons. The metal detectors that Vanello used were designed also in Denmark. It was very simple to control because icons replaced the letters and numbers. The same could be said for the computer scanner back at the base in Central Park West. It gave this advanced readout of all of the places throughout the city where there was potential beacon activity with icons that looked very similar. The last time one of the soldiers checked the main scanner, it was it said that there was at least 20 beacons littered all across the Lower West Side that still hadn't been found. There were nearly 40 in the meatpacking district and 70 in Chinatown. Hundreds of military and police made their way through Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx searching for the indicated beacons only to spend hours and hours with nothing to prove. It was a logistical nightmare, a complete geographic disaster attempting to find these strange beacons without any ability to read. And that's exactly what Brainstorm wanted from the very start. Chaos. Once the four soldiers made their way back out of the sewers, they found themselves in Washington Square Park. After covering the manhole, Russell reconvened with the squad and said, Okay, I guess that took a bit shorter than I thought. We'll need to make a call back to Briggs and get him over here again. Vanello brought a watch and could tell just by looking at the two hands. It was noon. Of course, because of the crisis, he couldn't read the numbers on the clock, so he was forced to improvise and squint. But after he did this and he looked up towards the park, he could see all of these adults and children gathering around this one woman like she was telling a story right on the steps of the square arch. Vanello pointed it out to Brussels and Liquidor. What's going on over there? Honestly, it looks like she's reading a book, but that's not possible, Brussels said after Thompson had successfully phoned Briggs to come back to his ra- with his radio communicator. Several members of the squad approached the scene, but not the entire squad. They didn't want to make sure that the large audience that this woman had culminated didn't feel like anything was wrong. Besides, the relationship between the civilians and the police and military had been complicated at best, especially in the time of the literary crisis. Many people felt that they weren't the most qualified people to get the technology to search for beacons underground. Often, the police and military would be blamed for the fact that America was still greatly affected by the Babel equation. People would say they aren't working hard enough, or they should really get professionals in here to search for the beacons. But the audience just stayed 
still as both Russell and Vanello approached the woman who they later found out was reading. She was wearing rags and torn up shoes. She had extended fingernails and her long hair was unkept. There was a good likelihood this woman was homeless. At least that's what Russell surmised. She read from the storybook with these playful monsters on the front of it and the two soldiers were baffled. She said, the big hairy monster cowered down in fear. I am sorry, little one. I did not mean to scare you. And little Elizabeth, she continued to narrate, she forgave the monster for frightening her. She made him some porridge and sent him off on his way. But before he could go, he told her he needed help finding the other monster brothers and sisters, his other monster brother and sisters. Elizabeth had no idea where they might be, but she was willing to help. Russell, being the brash and sometimes inconsiderate leader he was, planned on asking the woman how she was able to read midway through the storybook. But he was so taken by her storytelling skills that he kept quiet and listened to the tale she read. He didn't have to wait long before he found out the answer, though, because a passerby quickly asked the woman, How is it you're able to read? And she politely stopped the story and looked up towards the passerby. I just can't. I don't know. I wasn't able to for seven of the eight months, but only a couple weeks ago I started being able to read little by little. First it was the traffic signs, and then it was the billboards, and before you know it, I could read storybooks again. Who knows, maybe novels are next. And then she licked her fingers and attempted to read the story again. All right, now where were we? But before she could continue any longer, the passerby stepped through the small audience that was sitting on the brick as he made his way towards her. I'm so happy I found you. I work for the mayor, and he would require assistance from someone like you so we could start piecing things together. He started at the homeless woman and attempted to get her to follow him, but she denied his request very simply. I don't wish to go with you. I can't read anything complex, I promise you, she defended herself. But the man who was supposedly from the mayor's office wouldn't accept this as a fair response. He grabbed onto her arm and tried to force her up, telling her that even knowing how to pronounce letters would serve the mayor well. He told her that he had important treaties and pacts to sign that would give certain countries the ability to aid the United States in this time of crisis. Of course, the mayor had other people from different countries who would assist him with the legislation, but it would be useful to have someone who was able to read no matter what the level, at all times. The audience, including both Thompson and Liquidor, who had joined the circle moments before, expressed their disdain for the way the man sabotaged their story time. They shouted expletives at him, and several of them attempted to defend the woman when he tried grabbing her arm for the second time and pulling her off the step she was sitting on. Finally, the four soldiers stepped in and got the supposed representative to leave the area. He looked nothing like he, would wor he worked for the government and wore pedestrian clothes. I'm sorry about the interruption, Russell told the small audience as the representative started running towards an alleyway. Vanello poked Russell. There's something weird about that guy. I think we should go check it out. Russell doubted. And both Liquidor and Thompson also didn't think the guy was anybody to pay attention to, but they were wrong. Because when that strange man went into the into that alleyway on Waverly Place, he reconvened with a group of brainstormers and told them all about the woman who could read at Washington Square Park. He told the woman he worked for the mayor's office because he wanted to isolate her and kill her, and that shows she might trust him. He warned them about the military men who were listening along, and it was then that the brainstormers realized they needed to demonstrate physical force and fast if they wanted to catch the woman. If one of them could, can learn to read, she'll teach the rest to read. She'll find out how to transcribe Braille or something. I don't know, another member of the brainstormers said as he passed out these weapons to the other five members that were in the alley. We have to take her out. Consider her threat number one. Many of the members were wearing ski masks, but others were wearing the masks of goblins and werewolves. No commercialized characters, per se, but instead these were the kind of dynamic masks you would find at the back of a Halloween store. Whatever statement they were trying to make was unclear, but the statement didn't really matter. It's clear that at least... This group wanted chaos. They wanted the people who counted on reading, the people who had careers based on their literary understanding and capabilities to fail. The professors in universities, the bankers, the stockholders, the algorithm writers, and the scientists, the ones who had the positions they wanted. If they can't have them, no one can, right? The four soldiers made their way down Waverly Place and turned on University Place, where they would rendezvous with Briggs. Several shop owners handled, handed them fruits and vegetables that they could eat while they were on duty. Then they heard the gunshots ring in. What's going on? Liquidor asked. But the other three soldiers were already running to Waverly by the time he did. Russell put his back into the, onto this wall and laid his gun on his right arm. He looked out to Washington Square and saw these brainstormers aiming their guns high in the sky and firing. 
which caused the homeless woman's audience to race away. Go, go, he said, pointing towards a thick platform at the edge of the park that they might use to get a better edge on the brainstormers. This younger brainstormer held out a gun towards the homeless woman. You're coming with us. He shoved a bag over her head and then effectively knocked her out with his elbow. To the soldiers, it looked like he might have even broken her nose in the process. Russell got Thompson, Liquidor, and Vanello to put their guns over the brick platform and aim them at the brainstormer. Let her go. Let the woman go. But there were about five other monster-masked gunners who started to shoot at the four soldiers. They unloaded clips from behind trash cans, behind the arches of the Washington Square Park itself, and even behind food trucks and vehicles. Russell and his group were vulnerable, and he had to get them to a good cover before they were shot into. A kid behind a car shot Thompson in the shoulder with his what looked like an AR-15. Thompson covered it the second it happened, knowing very well that the kid was trying to aim for his head. Luckily, he jumped behind a large trash can before the gunner could knock him off. He put his back against the trash can and tried to fit on the back of it so no one could shoot him, and he could use it as a blockade. But this didn't prove to be helpful at all. In a matter of seconds, another brainstormer from across the park shot a rifle round into Thompson, which ripped through his heart. He bled out right there on the bricks. Russell, Vanillo, and Liquidor found out about Thompson's death when they got to the large water fountain. They could see his lifeless body lying there on the ground, being inspected by some of these brainstormers who were undoubtedly attempting to find some form of scanner he might have and destroy it so no one could find the beacons. Of course, they didn't find it because Vanillo had it instead. You said Thompson sent for Briggs? Russell said as he ducked underneath the water fountain, dodging the bullets that struck at the thick cement foundation. Liquidor, who assisted Thompson when he was calling Briggs, shook his head back and forth as he took the rifle off safety. Half his body was in the fountain's water as he did this, but he made sure to hold his gun just above the water so it wasn't affected. Russell thought that Briggs might be able to make it during the gunfight. There was a minigun on the top of his Humvee he could use to offer some assistance that would really free the three remaining soldiers from their sticky situation. Liquidor shot down one of the brainstormers that was hiding behind a large mailbox. Once he shot the masked gunner down, these letters flew out from the top of the blue stationary mailbox and flew through the air. The gunner's blood shot onto these flying envelopes that were carried by the wind and flew through Waverly Place towards the piers at the Hudson. To your left, Liquidor said as he spotted two brainstormers who emerged from behind this bush with little to no cover at all, but he wasn't too focused on reloading his gun to engage. So Vanillo shot down the two, both with either headshots or shots to near their upper torso. He hadn't run into a group of brainstormers since he was traveling to New York City with his squad, but he still didn't engage. Thankfully, he didn't have to, but this time the brainstormers were willing to fight and shoot because they knew there was a chance the homeless woman could help the United States becoming literate again. That was if she actually made it out. Once those peripheral brainstormers were taken out, There was only one holding the homeless woman hostage. One would think the hostage holder would want to kill the only woman in New York City, allegedly, with the known ability to read, but he didn't. This made Russell consider the idea that perhaps the brainstormers needed someone to read so that they would be able to plant their beacons. Maybe, he thought, they were planning on using their ability to read for themselves. But there was no time to debate his use for the woman. The second he had a clear shot on his head, he pulled the trigger and took out the masked gunner. The homeless woman was hopelessly crying by the time the soldiers got to her. It's horrible. It's hopeless. We won't ever get back. Apparently, she didn't have a concussion. I'm sorry, Liquidor told her as he held on to her. I'm so sorry. Liquidor guided the woman down the stairs and towards the Humvee that Briggs brought to the park. He buckled her into the car and went along with Brussels so they could report what happened when they were out looking for the beacon. Briggs sent several squadrons of soldiers to Washington Square Park so they could neutralize the area and attempt to find more brainwashers. Once they made it back to Central Park West, they walked the homeless woman to the tent where the supervising officer was. They told him about the situation, and the woman demonstrated her skills as a reader, but he promised her that he wouldn't exploit her power and he wouldn't let anyone else do the same. He told her they would offer her food, shelter, and clothing. They would find her books to read and try to make her life go on as simply as possible. He even suggested that they should let several children in the military base at Central Park West so they would have storytelling sessions. She liked that. Suddenly the world didn't seem as bad as it did. And through her efforts of helping the military find multiple beacons around the city, New York was one of the first places in the United States to almost entirely become literate again. This took about three years to achieve completely because the brainstormers were littered all across the city. 
but I think many of them started to give up, maybe, when they realized that reading was not a crutch. It offered opportunity, purpose, and strength. A lot of the military success was in the way they were able to use several of the readers around the states, there were about 12 in total, to decrypt Fade's unique Babel equation. With some of the brightest minds in the world, they were able to crack the code in time. Although the literary crisis lasted the better part of 15 years, it did end, and after it ended, there were more crises that arose through the wet work, of course, as they always would. But no one forgot the uniqueness of the literary crisis. It convinced everyone in some way that the safety of their jobs and the security they felt in the perception of reality was malleable. It was flawed. And after it was done, after the beacons were removed and Brainstorm was disbanded, some people were better for it. Okay, so that is the story of Babel Equation. I really liked it, and I think, honestly, I could expand upon the idea of this world where there is obviously no ability to read. I think there's a lot of different stories that I could tell within it, and I want to continue to do that with characters maybe from the... Um, Maybe we could even call it the far-fetched universe, um, which is something maybe we could expand upon, obviously, as we go further and further into this podcast. But I would really enjoy to do that. I would love to get artists to draw images of these characters. And, you know, uh, obviously, as we go forward with the podcast, maybe that can become a reality. Um, I hope you enjoyed the story. I hope it made you think. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell you that these stories are going to be perfect because they're not going to be perfect. Um, they are, no, no story is perfect, but I can always tell you I've put my 100% in to a story and I've never, you know, half-assed it or something like that. Um, and I just always am trying to make really entertaining content for you guys and I hope that you enjoy it. Um, with that being said, I am Ryan Hawk. This has been my story the Babel Equation, and I will be rejoining you for uh, reading the part two of Sabah uh, very shortly. Hopefully by the weekend we'll upload that episode. Anyway, thank you so much for listening, and hopefully you have a great day.